What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher, and this is the Meat Block Podcast, the weekly podcast by butchers for everyone. It's where we take a topic, discuss it in some amount of detail, and yeah, sometimes it's Q&A, sometimes it's storytelling, but before we get started, if you could do me the favor of heading over to Apple iTunes, typing in the Meat Block, and please leave a five-star review, and please please leave a comment. Thank you. And now, the show. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. This episode, I wanted to revisit the whole nose to tell tale uh, experience. There's a lot that people do with the offal or the organ meats or essentially the nose and the tail. So when I proposed the idea to Ryan and David, David submitted this wonderful piece about true nose to tail butchery. So I hope you enjoy it. Hey, meatheads, David here. In preparation of today's episode, I've been looking through all kinds of cookbooks, looking for obscure recipes, uh, you know, for noses and tongues and tails and ears and buttholes and what have you. But I think I've got enough of that, and I think I've read enough about it. Um, I'd like to talk more about the industrial uses of slaughterhouse byproducts. You know, there's all kinds of things that we use in our day-to-day life that you have no idea come from animals and animal waste. Now, generally, these things are produced not with animals that are killed specifically for that purpose, uh, but products that come from slaughterhouses, processing facilities, this and that, that are otherwise just going to go to landfills or to compost facilities. The first of which aids in something that I truly love, uh, commercial beer and wine production. There's a substance called isinglass. It's used during the fermentation or conditioning phases of uh, beer and wine production. And it's used as a clarifier. So it's made from pulverized fish bladders that are soaked in an acidulated liquid for several weeks. And at the end of it, all that's left is basically the collagen, which, as it turns out, is positively charged. So when you add this to the beer or wine, it's conditioning. Um, It takes atomized yeast particles that are floating, you know, making kind of a cloudy product. It attracts them, and then everything sinks to the bottom. It's kind of similar to, I think, using an egg white float in a bone broth to clarify it, you know, if you're making like a consomme or something. Another product, uh, it's called L-cysteine. This is another food-based processing aid. L-cysteine. L-C-Y-S-T-I-E-N-E. It's an amino acid, and it's used in dough conditioners. You know, So dough conditioners are various things that are added to a flour mix when you're making a bread dough that you know, subjectively improves the flavor, texture, preservation, what have you, of the dough and bread itself. For instance, in, um, in banh mi sandwiches, a Vietnamese banh mi sandwich, uh, baguette is always the bread for it. But these baguettes are a little bit different from your standard French baguette. And one of the reasons is that uh, to get the texture that is expected from a Vietnamese banh mi sandwich, you use citric acid in your dough as a dough conditioner, and it improves the texture. Um you know, as, a, as an at-home hack, you can use crushed up vitamin C tablets, from what I understand, which I have never done and probably never will. Uh, that being said, the uh, this amino acid um, is used as a dough conditioner. And the source of this commercial food-grade L-cysteine is human hair, duck feathers, or hog hair. It's then further processed into a powder, which is used for bread production. The human hair is collected from uh, the floors of barbershops. The duck feathers are collected from farms. And the hog hair is collected from slaughter facilities. And 
the majority of it is processed and produced in China. This food additive is uh, mostly found in breads, especially pizza dough and bagels, but it's also found in cheese and other dairy products. So if eating a derivative of, of human hair bugs you, then look for that on your label. It may also be approved for organic uh, use, depending on the labeling loopholes. So, you know, if there's something called a dough conditioner, if there's something called like an anti-caking agent or something like that on an organic food item, you may want to look more into it if you're really concerned about it. You got those two things. I don't know. There's all kinds of things that we make that are non-edible, though, that use animal byproducts. These are found in the industrial world, um, in the agricultural world, in the medical world. The first of which is very cliche, adhesive or glue. I know you've heard somebody say, oh, you're getting awful old and long in the tooth. We're going to have to send you out to the glue factory soon. You know, it's a common cliche. It's always used in commenting on someone's age. And it comes from sending horses uh, off to be processed into adhesive because hooves contain keratin, which is a very sticky protein substance. Since the 1700s, we've been commercially producing adhesives um, using animal remains. Primarily, hide scrapings, bones, hooves, heads, hair, ears, etc. are boiled or steeped in uh, various solvents or acidulated water for various amounts of time. The keratin or gelatin, but usually keratin, is the desired compound uh, because, again, it's a very sticky protein. And depending on the feedstock for the adhesive, whether it's um, horse hooves or fish bones, um, different feedstocks yield a more or less adhesive glue. So not all animal byproducts are created the same when it comes to creating ad- adhesives. Now, th- this ad- adhesive production is not the only place where livestock remains are used. In fact, the majority of money and labor in the world used in animal processing has nothing to do with edible meat. I've got a partial list here that I compiled uh, from a few for- a few sources, one of which was the um, Iowa State Extension, another was the Idaho State extension. And some of these were pretty surprising, as a matter of fact. So I'll kind of split these up by species, the first of which is beef. Beef brain, as it turns out, is a main constituent in anti-aging cream. So for you vegans out there, we've got a a large vegan audience. Um, If you're using any sort of anti-aging serum, you want to check to make sure that there aren't any sort of beef brain proteins in there. Beef bones. Of course, we know bone broth is a huge fad all over the country. Uh, But beef bones are also used as something called bone char. It's a natural charcoal that's used for purifying or decoloring white sugar. Another use, apparently bone char, is incredibly important in the production of high-quality steel ball bearings. Beef milk, not just for human consumption. The albumin that can be isolated from beef milk is also long, long since been the base for pigmented paint. Hooves. Not only are hooves good for adhesive, but keratin is a fibrous protein, uh, as I mentioned, that's the main structural constituent in um, binders the world over. Some of the items that use this as a binder are shampoo and conditioner, plywood and particle board, wallpaper, plant food of various types, photographic film, and band-aids. And then how could we possibly forget tallow and fats? I mean, that this is the most ubiquitous and um, rich resource that we've got as far as our rendering barrels go in the slaughterhouse. Fatty acids can be isolated and then used in industrial chemical ways too. You know, uh, some items where these fats are processed are then used are uh, detergents, toothpaste, shaving cream, 
deodorants, and insulating plastics, interestingly. Then we can't forget all the pharmacological and um, pharmaceutical applications from various internal organs. I mean, there's all kinds of things where the offal of beef are used for human pharmaceutical uses. According to the Iowa State University Extension, uh, processed constitu constituents of beef pancreas may be used in insulin, as well as digestive aids, burn and wound creams, and treatment for hypoglycemia. Oftentimes, vitamin B12 supplements are derived from beef liver, as well as heparin, an anticoagulant. Prolactin, or a, um, prolactin is a hormone used in stimulating milk production in mammals, including humans. It's often derived from um, beef's pituitary glands. Then you've got sheep. Sheep hide and wool is used in the production of carpet and rug pads, drum heads of all things, asphalt binder, tennis balls, baseballs, felt, and medicinal ointment base. But of all the livestock that we usually slaughter at the, at the processing facility, hogs by far have the most uses. <clears throat> Glycerin is made from hog fat. It's a clear odorless liquid. And uh, it's got a high desirability because of its high viscosity. In pharmaceuticals, it's used as a textural, textural enhancing additive, mainly to improve lubrication and the smoothness of a product. Some of these may be items such as, sh you know, shaving cream, toothpaste, or personal lubricants, including Astroglide and KY Jelly. The e-juice that you put in your vape thing, that uses glycerin as a main component. So, you know, that vegan tech bro that hangs outside the cell phone store with the cargo pants with all the zippers on it that's vaping all the time, that guy, he doesn't realize it, but he's smoking pig juice. Other uses for glycerin are insecticides, food service film like cling wrap, and crayons. Really, I think it's amazing how we utilize the entire animal in the modern manufacturing world. You know, uh, this may come as a surprise to many of our vegan listeners, because we do have a large crowd of them. Um, but it's old news to others. A question I'd like to pose, I suppose, uh, are, are these products more or less acceptable to vegans because we're utilizing more but wasting less? I mean, I'm unable to find evidence of animals being slaughtered for their industrial processing value, you know, for the most part, uh, because it all seems to be centered around utilizing waste products. And are the synthetic production of vegan alternatives more or less environmentally sound? I'm curious about that as well. Um, please send in any feedback you've got, because I, th I think that'd be a really cool episode to do in the future. So there you have it. That's just kind of scratching the surface of ways that we use animal by byproducts in our everyday life when you don't even think about it. Uh, and I think it's kind of hard to not use them, honestly. If, the, if any of you out there uh, work at a facility that processes animal byproducts for your industrial, commercial, or pharmaceutical uses, let us know. We'd love to hear about it and the process and, and how it's used. For better or for worse, we're going to keep doing it. So I think it's um, important for us to possibly acknowledge the sustainability or lack of using these items. That was great. Thanks, David. And I hopefully that made you think more about the bigger picture instead of the piece of meat or the primal that's in front of you when you're at their restaurant that think about the animal as a whole. And I said it in a recent episode that Elmer's uh, glue has a cow on it for a reason, even though it's hoof-free now. But just think about where you may possibly find parts of this industry and perhaps play this episode for 
that vegan annoying friend that you have that you could just be like, well, here's all the ways you're not vegan. Nah, I'm just joking. Not really. Do it. And David's segment reminds me of every argument or internal argument just because I'm not the type of person to get in a direct argument with a vegan because I don't have um, patience. But it made me think of the cult of euthanasia. And don't know, I'm not talking about school children in uh, the Orient running out of a building. I'm talking about euthanasia in the sense of uh, killing yourself. There's There was this cult called the cult of euthanasia, and it's a anti-humanist cult of vegans. And their slogan was, save the planet, kill yourself. And maybe they came up with this because they realized to be truly vegan and to truly support the planet and have their ideology be pure that they them and humankind couldn't exist and the funny thing about the cult of euthanasia is that they would have these rallies in boston common in the 90s and 80s and they'd have these signs uh, very graphic uh you know pro abortion signs and very graphic uh kill yourself signs and things like that but yet they were still alive protesting now, I'm not certainly advocating that these people uh, should die or anything like that, but I do believe that you should practice what you preach because a person is only as good as their word. So back to the lecture at hand, the nasty bits. I remember working with this old timer, John, and John helped train me. He was a fourth generation butcher and farmer. He was a wealth of knowledge and he was very good and told amazing stories. He was an old-timer in all sense of the words, even though he was probably only in his 50s. He would tell me great stories about growing up, utilizing the whole animal, doing hog slaughters and lamb slaughters with his father or with his friends. He would brag that him and a buddy did 50 lambs in such and such time frame I started doing the math and realized, well, I'm not going to correct you on how that's impossible and just live in the storytelling. Correcting him would not go over well either. One of his stories and one of my favorite stories is how a person came to his house for breakfast and told a joke. John asked him to leave because nobody is allowed to tell a joke before 9 a.m. unless he tells a joke first. One of my favorite anecdotes from him was, it was the middle of the night. He heard a noise. He gets out of bed with his sleeping gown and his sleeping cap. Creeps downstairs. Imagine a farmhouse, an old farmhouse that's generations old. He hears something in the kitchen. He creeps in. There's nothing. It's quiet. He decides, while I'm up, I might as well have a glass of milk. He opens the refrigerator, grabs the milk, and then shuts it. And when he shuts it, just like a movie on the other side of that refrigerator door, is the black bear. It stands up on his back legs and growls. John slowly wipes the milk mustache off of his real mustache reaches into his cutlery drawer and grabs a revolver, takes his stance, takes aim, and bam, kills the black bear in his own kitchen. Now I admit this story would be better if he would have reached into his cutlery drawer, grabbed a knife, and had a knife dance with the bear, like the Michael Jackson Beat It video but that's not how he relayed the story to me. And I was like, that's crazy, John. That's an amazing story. And he said, yes. But the shitty part of that story is I had about two hours of work ahead of me, dressing out a bear, and then another few hours of cleaning my kitchen in my custom shop in the barn. He tanned it, saved the head, made a bearskin rug, and the way this story ties into this week's episode is John, when I was first starting out, told me 
told me that the beginning of the meat industry in the 1800s was a byproduct of the leather industry. Europeans, with the term manifest destiny secured in their hands and their minds, moved western onto plain states, laying waste to once huge herds of bison. The hide is what was valuable at the time. With any luck, the rest of the carcass would give nourishment to the land. In our modern eyes, in the eyes of the current Native Americans, this is atrocious. Around the turn of the century, the refrigerated rail car allowed for the industrial shipping of meats. No longer salt product was the norm, allowing ranchers out west to grow their herds and then switching meat as the product and leather as the byproduct. If you've ever seen one of those old butcher knives, well, they still make modern versions today where they're long and they're kind of curved at the end. That's because the curved end with the ball on it is what you would use to side out an animal. Then you would use the heel of the knife in the straight part to cut your steaks and trim. Then the buffalo skinner came around, a shorter version of this knife, also known as a beef skinner. John told me that original lamb skinning knives were just worn down buffalo knives that were used over time in years. This next piece, Ryan is going to talk about real cowboy life. It was my first spring season as a ranch hand in northeast Oregon. I found myself in the company of real deal tobacco chewing, horse riding, American cowboys. Previously to this, I had had no idea that real cowboys still existed. But here I was, here they were, and they weren't sure what to make of me. I'd only been there a few days, and here I was mixed in with all these cowboys and cowgirls and cattle families mixed into their yearly calf sorting event and branding event that happened every year at this time. I would spend the next several months working closely with these people and getting to know them really well. But right here at the outset, none of us knew each other well at all. Uh, I was the only city folk present. I was extremely young. Um, There were several families there and several generations of cowboys and cowgirls there. We were in the the lowland areas of the Eagle Cap Wilderness, the Wallowa Mountains, northeast Oregon. And we were trying to corral, sort these calves, these spring calves, brand them, uh, check them, and give things like immunizations and turn some of the bull calves into steer calves, things like that. So yeah, I was the only city folk present at the event. They later told me that they were worried I might be judgmental of their cattle culture way of living. And that's understandable because they get a lot of judgment about their lifestyle from city folk that they have met throughout their lives. There's a lot of misunderstanding there, and there's a big cultural divide. So here I was. Once the the cattle were were more or less corralled by the cowboys, and we were beginning to they were beginning to try to rope certain calves, and then the ground crew would come in and do the ground crew work. Uh, uh, someone told me, "Hey Ryan, tackle that one, tackle that calf," and the cowboys were having difficulty roping this particular one. So I did. Boom! Tackled this tackled this animal. I had been a, a first string defensive safety on my football team in high school. So when someone told me to tackle something, I didn't have to think twice necessarily. It was very reflexive. Just tackle that shit. I can't do that anymore at all. But at the time, it was just like a reflex. I just did it. The Cowboys were thrilled it gave them all a good laugh to see me doing this. And um, they threw a rope down to me. And then one cowboy would rope. We'd get a rope around the hind legs. 
and the front legs and they'd kind of get the ropes taut and that way the ground crew would uh, would be able to come in and uh, stick a branding iron on it and uh, rope the ball or the, put a rubber band around the balls and uh, give a couple shots and things like that. So how does this relate to nose to tail eating? Well, these cowboys in Northeast Oregon weren't just any cowboys. The grandfather of the family was a world-renowned rangeland consultant and traveled a lot, advising rangeland managers across the world on how to improve their systems. In particular, Mongolian rangelands. Every other year they would travel to the same region of the Mongolian steppe to work on rangeland restoration projects there. And during these trips, they camped, hunted, and ate alongside their Mongolian hosts, who, over the years, became lifelong friends with them. So they're all very close. As these cowboys that I got to know told me stories of their Mongolian adventures, it was tremendously obvious that they had overwhelming respect for the customs and skills of these Mongolian friends of theirs. Mongolians, they describe to be incredibly hardy in the out of doors. With little more supplies than a little bit of flour, water, and some big chunks of mutton fat, and their hunting and fishing gear, they'd set out off with these Oregon cowboys driving deep into the back country in barely functional off-roading vehicles. When the truck would break down, as it was prone to do, one Mongolian guy would set to work on fixing it, and they were all incredibly handy with a wrench, while the others would get going on some hunting or fishing or some uh, to provide some, uh, some kind of lunch for everybody. These guys were experts at scrounging up some sort of fish or game meat when the situation called for it, and this fact, won them a lot of respect from the Oregon Cowboys, who are also hunters, hobby hunters. One day, I hope to get one of these guys uh, to tell us some more stories about their experiences on these trips, because they are just loaded with stories from years of, of going into the outback with these Mongolian friends of theirs. When they'd land a goat or wild sheep, their most favorite parts of the animals were the entrails, the organs, the head, and the eyeballs. My friend Tom talks about watching these Mongolians pass around a goat's head and looked like they were taking bong rips as they sucked out the brains through a hole in the skull. He just laughs and he just laughs. And he tells that story with with a hot fire going and a pot of water. They'd cook up and eat their favorite sections of intestine and internal organs first, and then and they would be completely thrilled about the intestines and, and different sections of stomach. And then they'd boil the remaining portions of the animal with some fat and flour to make a soup. All day, every day, this is how they ate on these trips. Very few vegetables or spices, if any, made appearances on these trips. Occasionally, they'd come across a family or small village, and they would be invited into their home for the night. Tom tells me that he remembers seeing infant babies sucking on a pacifier made out of a fatty lamb's tail which had a wooden stick poked crosswise through it so the baby could suck on the lamb's tail without following it, like a pacifier. Now, as someone who's raised a few babies of my own, I got to say that a fatty lamb's tail pacifier sounds brilliant to me. really does. From the Mongolian point of view, the lean meat on these carcasses were an afterthought. Lean meat was good for 
making a stew together with chunks of fat potatoes and dumplings after they'd feasted on their favorite parts of organs and entrails and other odd bits that they all had these crazy, amazing, complex recipes for. The muscle meat was not considered to be the prized portion of these animals. Traditionally, in a family setting, different organs of these animals were supposed to be eaten by different members of the family. How have we gotten so far away from this type of perspective in the West? How have we developed such tunnel vision where we fixate primarily on muscle meat as the only source of value or the only source of nutrition on an animal carcass? Many culinary traditions the world over still give great prominence to awful bones connective tissue, and the odd bits. If we're trying to learn how to prepare these parts of the animal in our nose-to-tail endeavors, there is no shortage of roadmaps. There's no shortage of recipes. Literally every subsistence culture since the dawn of humanity had ideas on how to capture nutrients from these odd bits, and every culture established recipes to make all parts of the animal useful and delicious tasting. Nose to tail eating is certainly not a new idea. It's having a comeback in the West only because culturally we've gotten so far away from it. To look at every part of an animal as valuable is a long forgotten distant memory. So now, The idea of snout-to-tail eating has become novel, novel to us. And novel things have a way of becoming trendy. Let me back up. It is consumer culture as a whole. And it's the major eating trends in the modern West that have forgotten about snout-to-tail eating. But it's not the whole society. I want to point out the industrial meat production machine has never forgotten about the value of the whole animal. And this fact is often overlooked when the subject of nose-to-tail eating comes up. Large packing houses are really, really good at recovering value from the whole animal. In fact, they're brilliant at it. Bones, fat, organs, nothing is wasted in these large packing houses. These corporate machines find outlets for every scrap of feather, every bone, every chunk of fat that passes through their doors. I have respect for the thoroughness that is the hallmark of the large packing house sector, even while I do not have respect for many of the nefarious and poor quality products that result from them. I couldn't help but think of the thoroughness of the large packing house when I worked in the small, whole animal butcher shop sector. We were a small, high-end meat shop, very wealthy clientele, and we did not have good systems in place for utilizing the whole carcass, the whole carcass of the animals which we were bringing into the shop. We tried our best, and we certainly were trying to do the right thing the moral thing. But the dirty truth was that all of the ungrindable trim, of which there's a lot, went straight into the dumpster in the alley behind our shop, and from there it went straight to the landfill. Not to be composted, not to be turned into rendering grease, to the landfill, where it still sits now, mixed in with dirty diapers and used band-aids. And we were producing many garbage bags full of this stuff every week. This was what first inspired me to make beef tallow soap. I was tired of seeing all that beautiful kidney suet fat going into the dumpster. And I was and I spear I tried to spearhead a project to make soap and start selling it in the shop. The first batch I made sold really well. 
we charged five dollars for each four ounce bar, which was very overpriced, but it flew off the shelf anyway. I had made them I had made the bars of soap in a hockey puck shape, like in a circle. The second batch of soap I made in a rectangle or square shape, and my boss didn't want to sell it. So I just kept it for myself and my family's usage. And I continued making hobby soap for friends and family thereafter. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And if you want to learn more about making soap out of Animal Bribe product, then please re-listen to episode 70 with Lacey Zope and check out Leaf Soap. I hope you learned something in this episode. I certainly did listening to it. And if you're wondering why I sound like garbage, it is because I'm getting over a cold. And that's why my segment was not as elaborate uh, or my presence wasn't that much in this week's episode is because it physically hurts the talk. It's like I swallowed a bunch of glass uh, or something or like a cat was stuck in my throat. It is raw, like ODB says. Raw dog to hot dogs. That's going to do it for this week's episode of the Meat Block Podcast. And if you want to get a hold of us here at the Meat Block, you could email us at the Meat Block Podcast at gmail.com. You could tweet us at the Meat Block Pod or Instagram, the Meat Block. We also have a Facebook group with a lot of good conversation in, happening over there. And I encourage you, if you're on the Facebook group, next time you see it in your feed, to add some friends. People you think might like the show, maybe a chef, culinary worker, or just someone who enjoys the carnivore lifestyle. And if you want to get a hold of us individually, if you want to get a hold of David, he is at a farm butcher on Instagram. Ryan is at Gather and Break on Instagram, and I am at American Butcher on Facebook and Instagram. And if you're wondering, hey, this is great content, how could I support them? Honestly, the best way to support us is by Opening the podcast device you are listening on, clicking on the app and going to the rating systems and giving us the highest rating, and please leave a comment. Another way is tagging us on social media and tagging friends on social media that you may think would enjoy this and using the hashtag the meat block. Big shout out to Simon the Butcher at Simon Butch in England where he is enjoying some teas and Maybe some crumpets, because he literally sent me a video of him enjoying a cup of tea. And it was amazing, and I felt that we had this intimate experience while he's drinking tea, and I sent him a video of me sitting in my pickup truck. And through the advancements of modern technology, it felt like we were right there having a conversation. But why am I talking about Simon the Butcher? Well, because he is our meathead of the week. And how did he become our meathead of the week? By using the hashtag, the meat block. And until next time, keep your knives sharp. And live in the margin. Early in the morning when the sun does rise, laying in the bed with bloodshot eyes, late in the evening when the sun sinks low. That's about the time my rooster crows I got women up and down this creek And keep me going and my engine clean Run me ragged but I don't fret Cause there ain't been one slow me down none yet Get me drinking that moonshine Get me higher than the grocery bill Take my trouble to the high wall Throw them in the river and get your fill We've been sniffing that cocaine Ain't nothing better when the wind cuts cold Lord, it's a mighty hard living But a damn good feeling to run these roads People try to tell me red Keep 
this living and you wind up dead Cast your troubles on the Lord of Lords Wind up laying on a cooling board But I got buddies up White House Road And keep me strutting when my feet hang low Rock gut whiskey gonna ease my pain And all this running's gonna keep me sane Get me drinking that moonshine Get me higher than the grocery bill Take my troubles to the high wall Throw them in the river and get your fill We've been sniffing that cocaine Ain't nothing better when the wind cuts cold Lord, it's a mighty hard living But a damn good feeling to run these roads It's a damn good feeling to run these roads Sing them hymns while the banjo plays You can tell them ladies that they ought not frown Cause there ain't been nothing ever held me down Law men, women, or shallow grave Same old blues, just a different day Get me drinking that moonshine Get me higher than the grocery bill Take my troubles to the high wall Throw them in the river and get your fill We've been sniffing that cocaine Ain't nothing better when the wind cuts cold Lord, it's a mighty hard living But a damn good feeling to run these roads It's a damn good feeling to run these roads It's a damn good feeling to run these roads.